Thank you to the organizers of Great Debates uh, and Updates of Hematologic Malignancies uh, for the invitation. This is the 2020 virtual presentation. I am John Allen, and I'm here uh, at Weill Cornell Medicine. I'm an assistant professor of medicine. I treat patients with CLL and other lymphoid malignancies, and I've been tasked with uh, presenting this topic, the use of prognostic markers in clinical practice for CLL. So our agenda today, we'll review the 2018 IWCLL guidelines, we'll review a few scoring systems, and then uh, overview of the recommended prognostic testing that's uh, uh, now being used in clinical practice. We'll look at the emerging prognostic and predicting uh, markers, specifically complex karyotype, stereotype B cell receptors, and mutational profile and beyond P53. And then we'll look at what is important and what are the predictors of response in the era of novel agents such as BTKIs and venetoclax. So what are the 2018 IWCLO guidelines say? Well, in general, uh, this is recommended for the baseline evaluation of CLL patients. It is recommended always before treatment. Uh, I frequently will do this at diagnosis of my CLL patients, but definitely before treatment, all of these things should be done. It is now considered sort of the standard of care. So FISH testing is always recommended. Uh, I think this is routinely employed by most physicians. Uh, patients do ask for this. They are, they are informed and they're wanting this information. So definitely uh, always do that. Uh, P53 mutation analysis is now recommended for all patients prior to therapy. This was a relatively new addition to the 2018 updates uh, and, and is now uh, a recommended test to be obtained for our patients. Uh, as, as well as IGHV mutational analysis. So this is the antibody gene, this is the mutated or the unmutated patient, uh, and, and this is very predictive and prognostic of, of outcomes and uh, is a major uh, decision point on how you might wanna treat a patient uh, if you're considering chemoimmunotherapy. Serum beta-2 microglobulin is a lab test. It's desirable in clinical practice, though frequently it does not get sent, uh, but you can calculate certain scoring systems, uh, uh, scoring um, points uh, and sc scoring systems using this, uh, using this data. So uh, desirable, we send it, I send it, but uh, not everyone does, uh, just be aware of that. So why is this important? Well, the CLL IPI is a scoring system that is widely used and employed. And empl it, it takes into account these risk factors that I just talked to you about. So this employs the NGS, the next generation sequencing and the FISH analysis. Uh, if you're P53 disrupted, you get four points. If you have your mutational status and you're unmutated, you get two points. If you have your beta-2 microglobulin and it's abnormal, another two points. Your clinical stage, which we all have, uh, is one, and, and age, which we all have for our patients, is, is one. And you can uh, calculate this and add it up, and you put your patients into these four risk categories, low, intermediate, high, or very high. And it's very good at predicting and, and stratifying our patients in terms of survival in the era of chemotherapy, as well as predicting what I use this for uh, when I use it is really more to, to predict the time to first treatment as it stratifies these patients very well. And you, and you can identify these people who may progress rather quickly. What's important to note is that clinical testing uh, is not routinely performed for our most patients. So uh, Anthony Mato and colleagues looked at a registry of uh, community practices across the United States and found, uh, if you look at this test, uh, in the previously untreated patients, 57% uh, of patients did not have FISH analysis. 81% um, of patients did not have P53 mutational testing and 81% of patients also did not have IGHV mutational testing. So we are vastly underestimating uh, or under testing our patients. And we're kind of, if you're doing that, you're flying blind for the most part on how best to treat that patient and potentially treating them. As we found in this study uh, and not shown, um, a third of patients that were known to be P53 disrupted were receiving chemoimmunotherapy with FCR or BR. So a third of those patients were potentially uh, um, not getting uh, a better treatment with, with BTKI. So what are, so it's important to note that. And so what are role of emerging prognostic markers? And so here is the IWCLL guidelines again, and I highlight here the complex karyotype. So it's not generally indicated in general practice, though it is becoming more and more uh, available and performed across laboratories. In clinical trials, it's desirable. And so what is this, why is this important? Well, um, 
Historically, CLL, the uh, carry typing has been hindered by the failure of CLL B cells to divide readily in cultures. B cells in general don't do that. And so over the past decade, uh, this has been optimized and using different um, uh, mitogen type uh, um, uh, um, agents such as CPG oligonucleotides, there's been improved efficiency and, and consistency across cytogenetic labs. It allows for the detection of abnormalities in subjects with normal eye fish, uh, as well as other patients with, with other abnormalities. But of note, a third of patients with normal eye fish had karyotypic abnormalities that you might presumably wonder uh, that they didn't have otherwise. Subjects with those abnormal karyotypes were found to have shorter time to first treatments and overall survival. Complex karyotype is the worst risk. Uh, it's not universally divine, defined, but generally accepted as greater than three abnormalities across two or more metaphases. The definition of this is evolving, and there is now a high complex karyotype subgroup, which is having greater than five or more abnormalities. So why is this important? Well, complex karyotype is predictive of outcomes. 15% of all CLL cases at diagnosis have a complex karyotype. And mind you, this sequenced thousands of patients on their baseline CLL. And so 15% at diagnosis uh, uh, have a complex karyotype. Not surprising, it's, it's more common to be associated with advanced disease, P53 disruption, unmutated antibody genes, trisomy 12, high risk features, basically what we know of CLL. It's found in 8% of MBL cases. So these are people that we think are precursor lesions that, that kind of just peter along, but 8% of them have a complex karyotype and I would presume and, and are likely to progress rather quickly. Uh, you can be falsely assured um, that deletion 13Q is all good risk because 5% of those deletion 13Q had a complex karyotype. 87% of them were free of P53 disruption. Interestingly though, you can find good risk features. So complex karyotype isn't created equal all the way around. When you find one uh, with a trisomy 12 and 19 positive, uh, trisomy 19, these predict the best prognosis. This group here is in the blue arm and they actually do really well. So you might be able to get some positive uh, feedback from, from this. And then the high, high complex karyotype patients do the worst here, as you can see. So moving on to the next uh, uh, kind of novel prognostic factor that we're looking into, uh, that's the stereotype B cell receptors. So uh, throw back to immunology 101, uh, B cells are born in the bone marrow. They all undergo a random VD and J recombination at, uh, that's random. And then uh, into the lymph node, somatic hypermutation upon antigen stimulation can uh, allow the potential synthesis of up to 10 times 10 to the 12th immunoglobulin structures. Up to a third of these express identical immunoglobulin structures, interestingly, in CLL. And this is what is termed as a stereotype B cell receptor. Uh, for the most part, they are, uh, for the most part, these stereotype B cell receptors are restricted to a, a, a rather limited number of subsets of about 18 subsets or so. But these are the four most famous and most prog prognostic and potentially predictive of outcomes uh, for our patients. And we'll go into that more later. So when you look at uh, these, the specific subsets from this study, uh, basically subset number one uh, did not find to be significant. It didn't differentiate itself from other unmutated CLL. Subset two, which uh, uses a V3-21, uh, uh, found to be very aggressive CLL. It could be mutated or unmutated. And the mutated form uh, that's stereotyped uh, was very aggressive. And uh, if you're seeing this, you could have a false sense that these patients may do well because they have a mutated antibody gene, when in reality, they're going to have very aggressive, treat, uh, aggressive CLL. Subset four, these patients uh, had very favorable prognosis. They had very indolent disease. They had long time to first treatments, long progression-free survivals to treatment, and actually do really well long-term. So if you see a V4-34, and it's, it's potentially stereotyped, you can uh, reassure the patient there and potentially manage them a little bit differently. Subset eight, these are the V4-39 patients. They're rare, but they have high rates of Richter's transformation. They can have aggressive clinical behavior, and essentially uh, they have shorter progression-free survival than other patients, uh, uh, other subsets within this group. So busy slide here, but ultimately to drive home some points, subset number four is the red line here. 
and these patients have very indolent disease and they separate themselves from the mutated good risk feature patients. Uh, and, and basically all of the outcomes that are looked at. And then the, the subset number two, these are mutated uh, patients, mind you, IGHV, these are mutated, but they follow the aggressive higher risk patients and do not follow the long of the line of the mutated IGHV. So if you see this, you cannot have a false sense that of security that the, the, the disease will behave indolently because in fact, it will follow along with the more aggressive disease. So what is the role of next generation sequencing beyond P53? Uh, well, all of these mutations here are noted to be uh, uh, associated with poor outcomes uh, when you're using chemoimmunotherapy as outlined here. And while not currently technically recommended to evaluate in routine practice, uh, with novel agents and large sequencing panels, we get these, these, uh, uh, this data and it does maybe impact how I follow patients up and or influence my treatment decisions, uh, despite the fact that, you know, there's no strong data or, or recommendation to, to utilize those in decision making. So uh, in the era of chemoimmunotherapy, this just highlights the points here that uh, time to first treatment uh, up here for ATM, SF3B1, Notch1 uh, is worse than wild types, and that overall survival when using chemoimmunotherapy is worse uh, with, with these mutations. Uh, again, just again, highlighting the fact of combining all of this information can identify very high risk patients. So if you have a notch one, high rates of Richter's transformation, you combine a notch one with a V4-39, that's a stereotyped patient, their risk of transformation at five years approaches 80%. And again, P53 disruption has a hazard ratio uh, of, of uh, increased uh, Richter's transformation uh, uh, threefold over uh, some of these other pa uh, patients. So uh, these are risk factors. And if you're identifying them, you definitely want to uh, manage your patient a little bit differently. So what does this all mean in the era of novel agents? Well, what cytogenetic categories are relevant? What are the differences in outcome based on antibody gene uh, mutational status? What mutations are now relevant, if any? And how does this impact continuum versus fixed duration? So when you look at ibrutinib uh, cytogenetics, uh, it appears that there's no real major cytogenetic uh, driver in terms of poor outcome. And in fact, deletion 11Q, which is historically a poor predictor for, uh, of outcome with treatment of chemoimmunotherapy um, identifies patients who do extraordinarily well with, uh, with ibrutinib. These are deletion 11Q patients in Resonate 2 versus all other patients. And mind you, no deletion 17 patients were allowed in this study, but they are trending to towards doing better. When you look at P53 disruption, you can see that these uh, 34 patients that are P53 treatment naive treated with ibrutinib out five years have a very similar progression-free survival than what we see for patients uh, uh, on the Resonate 2 study. And so, uh, you know, is some of this poor risk feature overcome by ibrutinib and continual therapy? It appears so. Small numbers, but very thought-provoking. When you look at relapse refractory disease, again, there is no real statistical significance in the Resonate study, though things started to trend out. The 11Q, again, another signal for maybe pro uh, improved progression-free survival, complex karyotype, high-risk patients, again, trending towards potential worse uh, uh, progression-free survival. Here just summarizes uh, taking a meta-analysis of pooled data that 11Q, when you have power of, of a significant number of patients compared to those without 11Q, seem to do better uh, uh, with ibrutinib uh, treated uh, treatment regimens. Uh, this pooled Resonate, Resonate 2, and Helios together. And so this is where this data is pooled from. And the 11Q patients do better with ibrutinib compared to those without 11Q on ibrutinib. So it's intriguing, thought-provoking, and maybe we should be treating these patients uh, with BTKI, at least some type of a backbone there. So what about venetoclax? Well, with venetoclax, uh, P53 disruption seems to be a predictor for inferior progression-free survival. Uh, mind you, you stop therapy, and uh, once you stop therapy in these patients, they start to, to, to progress. So uh, it says something about the disease biology uh, of, of this clone that, that potentially is, is rapidly uh, dividing or, or fa dividing faster than others. In Murano, it didn't really sort out, but again, follow-up is short, and this is at two years, and all patients were on continual treatment here, so the 17P deleted patients didn't do necessarily worse. We'll see how this goes uh, as patients stop therapy and, and see if it follows this similar pattern that we saw in the CLL14 study. 
When you look at IGHV, it's a busy slide here, but I don't want to, to, to confuse you. Ultimately, just look at the fact that everything overlaps. It does not matter if you are mutated or unmutated when you're using ibrutinib-based treatments. When you look at venetoclax, maybe it does matter. If you stop therapy, this starts to separate, but um, it separates very late. And you can see here, close to 70% of patients as we're approaching year four, three years off of venetoclax are still progression free. So that's still an outstanding outcome. Uh, and I guess, you know, we have to, to understand uh, and make decisions on what is considered not good enough to, to not offer a stopping therapy for our unmutated patients. This basically highlights the, a similar thing from, from Murano. When you look at mutations, uh, really only ibrutinib has been uh, reported mutational, you know, sub-analyses uh, in Resonate, which is uh, relapse refractory patients, but there did not appear to be a single mutation that we look for and we know is poor risk in the era of chemotherapy uh, that predict worst outcomes with ibrutinib. Uh, with the exception being P53, which trended towards, and it was pretty close, and, and probably with additional follow-up will we'll potentially meet statistical significance, uh, as well as FSF, SF3B1. So these patients with these mutations may have uh, inferior uh, progression-free survival in relapse setting. We really have never been able to show any mutation uh, in, in a treatment-naive setting that might impact on worse outcomes. So uh, ultimately, if you're using these drugs, these mutations sim simply don't matter when one, once you start to get a response, though obviously you do not want to be giving these patients chemoimmunotherapy, and so that's why this is still very, very important because you want to be giving them ibrutinib. So variables associated with ibrutinib discontinuation. Again, when you look at discontinuations due to CLL progression, really what comes out, P53 deletion and complex karyotype, uh, as well as a younger age. Now, most of these patients were re relapse refractory. So how does this change in a frontline setting? It is possible that it can do that. Um, and when you look at transformation, what's important, complex karyotype and MYC abnormalities. And when you look at patients discontinuing ibrutinib due to toxicity, age and prior lines of therapy, which is intuitive and makes sense. Older patients with uh, uh, decreased immune systems and, and beat up from prior therapies are going to tolerate the drug a little bit less. So in summary, IFISH, IGHV, and P53 mutational analyses are indicated in all CLL patients prior to treatment. Um, growing evidence suggests that these tests are still not routinely performed despite the guidelines uh, and strong data to support their prognostic and predictive capabilities. Uh, there's increasing recognition for the potential of stimulated karyotyping and IGHV stereotyping to impact clinical management. And while not currently recommended, evidence suggests sequencing of genes beyond P53 do have the potential to impact clinical management uh, in terms of how you may monitor them prior to treatment. Uh, and in the era of targeted therapy, these classic prognostic variables remain relevant to predict initial clinical behavior, but appears to have lost some significance, certain ones like 11Q and, and IGHV uh, when, when using targeted approaches, with some exceptions here, such as deletion 17P, complex karyotype, and P53 mutations, which still have some evidence showing inferior outcomes despite the use of these targeted approaches. So I thank you for your uh, attention during this uh, during this talk. I I will be available for for uh, the phone call later on uh, during the live event. Thank you very much.